اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی سیدنا محمد و آله الطاهرین ورس نمبر 131 اف سوره النساء ولله ما في السماوات وما في الارض ولقد وصينا الذين اوتوا الكتاب من قبلكم واياكم أن اتقوا الله وإن تكفروا فإن لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وكان الله غنيا حميدا To Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. We have certainly enjoined those who were given the book before you and you that you should be wary of Allah but if you are faithless It's a fact that to Allah indeed belongs whatever is in the earth, is in the heaven, and whatever is on the earth. And Allah is all sufficient, all laudable. This verse and the next one wrap up all the previous discussions, as I mentioned about family relations, as well as dispute with the people of the book. by turning our attention to the most sublime Quranic version, taqwa. And as you see, it has a repetition, وَلِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ at the beginning of the verse and towards the end of the verse. This repetition, of course, is, uh, is there for a reason, which I will mention, inshallah. First of all, لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ signifies the ownership of Allah. That everything in the heavens and the earth, the owner, the one who owns them is Allah. We have another expression in the Qur'an, وَلِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Mulk signifies rulership, kingdom, authority, sovereignty. Now, in the case of Allah, both sovereignty and kingdom and ownership return to the same thing, because Allah's ownership is a real ownership, not something which has been uh, uh, credited by the people. It's not conventional. Our ownership usually is conventional, except what belongs to us in our body, in our soul. Otherwise, when I say this house belongs to me, it's a conviction. It doesn't really belong to me, because if I die, someone else takes it. So, as a convention, I say this belongs to me. But, when we say the creation belongs to Allah, it means that it cannot persist and exist without Him. It is he who's holding it. Allah is holding the heavens and the earth lest they disappear. They are removed from the, uh, the page of existence. So, in a sense, his ownership is his sovereignty because he really owns things His control is in his hand. Sometimes you may have ownership, but we may not have authority and sovereignty, and vice versa. But in the case of Allah, لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ and لِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ return to the same thing. Now, if you can imagine this ownership, whatever is the heavens, and earth, whether we take heavens as the different compartments and sections of the universe, or we take it as different layers and levels of, uh, of creation, the material, physical world, the supernatural world, Malakut, Jabarut, if we take Samawat as that. If you think about that ownership, what type of property is this, then we really turn to God for everything, especially because 
in addition to having the ownership, he is the one who controls, who dispenses, who takes away, who gives. So we have to turn to him. And this is mentioned after the previous verse. وَأَيْنْ يَتَفَرَّقَاهُ If the couple separate, Allah will suffice them from his sa'ah, from his vast ownership. And then the vast ownership here is described as وَلِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Now, uh, the following sentence وَلَقَدْ وَسَّيْنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ أَنِ اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ And we uh, advised, enjoined those who were given the book before you and you that you should be wary of Allah. Why is this mentioned here? Because the family relationship, of course this is very general, but it says it's in the context of the previous verses, it needs taqwa. Whether separating or living together, good behavior, good interaction, it needs taqwa. And taqwa is not something that we have enjoined you alone. This has been the continuous injunction, instruction of Allah from the beginning of creation of human being and then even up to the end of the world. So because us as Muslims are going to live, inshallah, until the end of the, as, as a community, there's no other uh, community after the community of Islam. In, 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 in religious terms. So, not only before we have enjoined everyone to taqwa, until the end, our instruction, my instruction, is taqwa. Being mindful of God. In fact, the verse is saying this, is a universal and central command. وَلَقَدْ وَسَّيْنَا الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ and is applicable to all faiths, to all people. And therefore taqwa is something which is the instruction that never ever can be ignored. Of course, it may find different forms in the, at different times, different situations, but the whole point is that we have to be wary of God. We have to consider God in our decisions, actions, and fear if we violate that. There's one very beautiful hadith in Misbah al-Shari uh, uh, reported from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq in which he mentions this verse actually about taqwa. He said, وَقَدْ جَمَعَ الله ما يتواصي به المتواصون من الأولين والآخرين في خصلة واحدة. God has summarized the best advice enjoined by anyone from the beginning to the end of times in one quality. تقوى وهي التقوى يقول الله تعالى وَلَقَدْ وَصَّيْنَا الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ أَنْ اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ We have certainly enjoined uh, those who were before, before you, those who were given the book before you and yourselves, that you should be wary of Allah. Then he says, the Imam says, وَفِيهَا it captures every righteous worship. It's by taqwa that anyone can ever reach elevated stations and lofty ranks. Whoever has reached these ranks has reached it by taqwa. It's by taqwa that anyone ever gets to live hayatul tayyibah, blissful life, as is mentioned in the Quran. Man amila salihan 
من ذكر أو أنثى وهو مؤمن فلنحيينه حياة طيبة Whoever does good whether male or female and they are the mu'min they have faith then we give them a new life an extra life which is al-hayat al-tayyib al-hayat al-tayyib means you are in a sense elevated from the temptations of this world from the illusions of this world and you live in a completely different environment and that's why uh, by Imam Ali alayhi salam, it's, it's, uh, it's explained by Imam Ali alayhi salam, al-hayat al-tayyiba means al-qana'ah, to be satisfied. This is what we are after, after all, isn't it? Uh, so, al-hayat al-tayyiba has been reached by taqwa, could be reached by taqwa, wal-uns da'im, and uh, an intimacy, which never ends. Intimacy with God. Wow, this is what every every person should desire. And then he says, قال الله عز وجل إن المتقين في جنات ونهر في مقعد صدق عند ملك مقتدر. Indeed, the God where he will be amid gardens and streams. That's one thing. In an in a position. approved by God as a companion of the king living in company of the omnipotent king so this is our taqwa so when as I said since this is in the context of the previous verses whether in that dispute about robbery whether in family relations, whether in jihad, whether in dealing with other people, taqwa is the golden rule, the golden element. And then it repeats what was mentioned in the, at the beginning of the verse, وَإِن تَكْفُرُوا فَإِنَّ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ بَالْأَخِرِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ But if you are faithless, We have enjoined all human beings from the beginning to the end to taqwa. But if you are faithless, what happens? That doesn't change anything, actually. That doesn't change that to Allah belongs the ownership of whatever is in the heaven, whatever is in the earth. Your denial and ingratitude doesn't change the reality. It will still be within God's kingdom and under his command. So, we know many people do not believe. And it's, it's, a, it's a mental uh, attitude, isn't it? Our mental attitude doesn't change anything, anything outside. Whether we believe in God or we do not believe in God, if God does not exist, Our belief in him doesn't change the reality. And if he exists, then our ingratitude, our kuf, our disbelief doesn't change anything. This is what the verse is trying to say. Well, you may decide to, to disbelieve, you may decide to reject, then that doesn't change anything. The fact is that لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَخْرِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَنِيًّا حَمِيدًا Allah is of course needless and laudable. Ghani, your kuf doesn't in any way harm him and your ingratitude doesn't change the fact that he is Hamid, he is the one who is praised in all the universe. The next verse, interestingly, actually repeats again this sentence. It's verse 132, wa ma fil ard, wa kafa billahi wa To Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. And Allah suffices as trustee, wa kafa billahi wa This kafa billahi wa is actually a result, a conclusion of 
بسيتمت يا لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض. Uh, now you have noticed this sentence has been repeated three times, twice in the previous verse, once in this verse. In each instance, of course, the statement is used as a premise for a different conclusion. Let's let's now try to uh, to see if it works. The first instance says everything is in need of God, isn't it? Everyone is in need of God. If they separate, they need the uh, the bounties of Allah in His vastness, in His vastness. So everyone is in need of Allah. The second, it says that God is needless of everything, isn't it? Because what in takfu, even if you reject, if you deny, that doesn't change anything. God is not in need of you to approve that everything belongs to Him. It's a fact. And the third one says, If everything belongs to him and he has control of everything he is sufficient to rely upon him as a trustee as a protector as a giver you don't need to go anywhere else, anywhere else. of course we may have, uh, seek means but not independent of god nothing can act independently from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the first instance justifies God's promise that uh, uh, Allah is all born to you, all wise. The second one is a response to if you are faithless, explaining God's absolute needlessness and justifying that Allah is sufficient. And the last one in the current verse is a prelude to the next verse. In Yasha Yudhibkum Wa Yatiba Akharin Wa Ma Wakan Allah Kakadira. If he wishes, he will take glory. So Walillahi Mafis Samawat wa Mafil Art, he can do whatever he wishes. Of course his wish is based on Hikmah and wisdom. So verse coming to verse 133. Ayyasha Yudhibkum it is just a, a continuation. وَلِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ To Allah belong whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth and Allah suffices as trustee and a yasha يُذْهِبْكُمْ وَيَأْتِ بِأَخَرِينَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ قَدِيرًا If he wishes, he will take you away. O mankind, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ أَيْ يَشَعْ يُذْهِبْكُمْ أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ or mankind, and bring others in your place. Now, Ayyuhannas may mean all mankind, or it may mean all the adversary of the Qur'an. We will discuss that. Which one? Mankind, or those who are uh, addressed by the Qur'an at the time of the Prophet. He takes you away, brings another people, or he takes mankind and brings another creation. We'll discuss this. أَنْ يَشَعْ يُذْهِبْكُمْ أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ وَيَأْتِ بِأَخَرِينَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلَى ذَلَكَ قَدِيرًا If he wishes, he will take you away, O mankind, and bring others in your place. Allah has the power to do that. And Allah has the power to do that. He has always had the power. كَانَ اللَّهُ عَلَى ذَلَكَ قَدِيرًا He has always had the power. If he hasn't done that, it doesn't mean that he can't do it. Or if he has done it in certain cases, it's just an evidence for his power. Now, if all, you and all nations who are enjoined to, to be wary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, if he wishes, and if you disobey that, he can take you away. He is actually enjoining you to tap one, not because he is in need of that, because you are in need of that. 
Because the continuation of your life depends on that. So he can easily replace you with other people, just as he took away the previous generations to open room for you. Uh, with regards to any yashak yud hibkum ayyuhannas wa ya'ati ba'akharim, Allah wa ta'ala ta'ala rahmatullah, and he says that uh, the context is about, of course, calling people to, to taqwa. And explaining taqwa to be uh, an instruction for all nations, the people of the book, before you and you. However, Allah is not in need of that. He says this, uh, and then he says, he is the owner of everything and disposes of it as he wills, and in the way he wills. If he wills that it be he should be worshipped and feared, and you do not do that. Of course, his will, as I said, is based on the hikmah and on the benefit of the creation. He doesn't take any benefit. And if you do not do that properly, he then is able to remove you and bring forward others who will do what he loves and is pleased with. And God is capable of that. Now, as I said, with regards to Ya'te Ba'akharim, it may mean he takes the human race from the earth and bring another creation, which may be different, completely different. Or he may take you, who are now listening to the Quran and do not uh, comply with the rules of taqwa, and bring another people, not another creation. Uh, in your place. Allah wa ta'ala ta'ala says that uh, since the context is instruction for taqwa and this is something related to human beings so it doesn't mean that he brings a new creation. It means he will new bring a new people. And then he mentions a hadith from the Prophet, which is reported by both Sunni and Shia, that when this verse was revealed, uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, tapped on the back of Salman and said, They are the people of this man. That means the, the Persian. Uh, and he says, this hadith actually is an evidence that Ya'tib al doesn't mean he brings a new creation, he brings a new people. However, the uh, commentators have actually uh, considered both meanings. For example, in Kashaf, the Mahshari, uh, uh, Mu'tazari commentator says, Wa Ya'tib al means وَيُوْجُدُ إِنْسَانْ آخرين مَكَانَكُمْ أَوْ خَلْقًا آخرين غَيْرَ الْإِنْسِ He brings a new community of people uh, instead of you or he brings a new creation other than human beings. So he says both of them are possible. Allama said based on the context this is not, the second is not the uh, the desired meaning. In Anwar Tanzil Beizabi also mentions the same thing. He creates other creation in your place or he brings other people. And then he says it is actually said that this is addressing those who oppose the Prophet, peace be upon him, the Arabs. هو خطاب لمن آدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم من العرب. So, أي يشاء يذهبكم أيها الناس means أي نشاء يذهبكم أيها العرب أو عرب أو those who are adverse by the Quran or those who are opposing my messenger be wary that he can bring another community, and then he says, yes, this is understood from other verses, وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْا 
يستبدل قوما غيركم if you turn away Allah will replace you by another people another community so actually this verse which he mentions is an evidence that يعتبى آخرين means another community not another creation and then he mentions the same hadith that it is reported from the Prophet so this is Sunni and we had the, the Shia Mufassar as well that when the verse was revealed he tapped uh, the uh, Salman's back and said it is his people now uh, Allah wa ta'ala ta says changing the creation not changing the people of course here we have the evidence the context tells us that it is about changing the community giving this mission giving this blessing to another community of human beings but he said from other verses we may understand that Allah has also threatened that oh human race we can take you away and bring another creation that we know he said that could be understood from Alam tara anna Allah khalaqa as-samawati wal arda bil haqq in surah Ibrahim ay yasha yudhibkum wa ya'ti bi khalqin jadid do you not consider that Allah has created everything on the earth and in the heavens and on the earth with haqq and if he wishes he can remove you and bring khalq the jadid new creation that's a new community you know. he says this is possible from those verses but this verse does not especially uh, considering the hadith of the prophet peace upon him it is not uh, implying the, this meaning also in surah fatir ya ayyuhan nas antumul fuqara ila allah wallahu huwal ghaniyul hamid the same meaning as is mentioned here. O mankind, you are the ones who stand in need of Allah. And Allah is all sufficient, all lovable. If he wishes, he will take you away and bring about a new creation. And that is not a hard thing for Allah. So, here, what we understand from, I mean, putting all these verses together, Allah is giving us both possibilities. However, the second possibility, new creation, has not happened and will not happen. It's just a hypothetical statement about the power of God. If he wishes, he takes you away, O human being, and brings a new creation creates a new creation like you having uh, having free will and enjoining them to taqwa so that they comply so this meaning could be understood from those verses but this is a hypothetical statement but the first one he takes you and brings a different community that is something that the, that hadith says that will happen and we see the signs of it actually how uh, Arabs especially after the Prophet those things which happened and then time of Banu Umayyah we saw and now even in our time we see such things so at at the end of the verse, he says, وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ ذَلِكَ قَدِيرًا And Allah is quite potent, able to do that. Now, again, you see the verb kana, which implies the past tense used. And Majmu al-Bayan says the same thing as we said about other statements similar statements he says kana allah means lam yazal subhanahu wa la yazal qadam he has always been uh, had the power to do that always he had the power to do that and he will have the power to do that until the end of the world and uh, 
Then he says, he, he, he mentions the both things, ala al-ibdal wa al-ifna'i wa al-i'ada, to replace you by another people, or to completely wipe you out as human race, and bring a new uh, creation which would comply with his rulings. Then, of course, verse number 134 is related to this, to the context as well, which, inshallah, we will discuss in our next session. رَبَّنَا لَا تُذَغَ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ حَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَذُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَحَّابِ وَسَلَّمَهُ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِهِ الطَّاهِرِينَ